Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be the COVID-19 Crisis of Legitimacy, a why for Radical Exchange. I'd like to welcome Manny Mitty to the virtual stage to begin our session. Hi, all. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be in conversation with uh, a great person and a good friend of mine, Glenn Whale. Uh, Glenn is the founder and chairman of Radical Exchange Foundation, uh, but during his day job, he's the, he works in the Microsoft office of the chief technology policy, political economist and social technologist, Octopus Hurl. Uh, Glenn advises Microsoft senior leaders on the relationship between the global political economy and the future of technology. He's a super mensch and a, a brilliant guy, and uh, I'm excited to hear what you have to say about the current crisis club. Thanks so much, Manny. It's an honor to be here with all of you. I have to say, you know, I, um, I'm no longer uh, really an active executive of Radical Exchange. I'm, I'm more a non-executive chair, and, and seeing what all of you have put together in this program, the way uh, this community has come together and all the things that we pre presented, it, it's incredibly humbling to see what's come out of, um, of all of this. Um, so it's particularly humbling to be joining you um, the day after Juneteenth, a day of celebration of the struggle for freedom and commemoration of uh, the losses that we've suffered in that struggle. And just want to take a moment to remember the people who have so, um, so courageously given their lives uh, in, in the fight for, for freedom. Um, and I hope their memories will dedicate us all um, to struggling with them and their families and the people who remember them uh, for a more equal and just society. Um, today I wanna talk however, a bit more about um, COVID, uh, something that many of you know uh, I was involved in the response to, uh, together with Danielle um, from the Radical Exchange team and Audrey and, and, and many others from the Radical Exchange community and beyond, um, we created something called the Con Committee for Pandemic Testing, which became a central coordination point for the uh, much of the response to the epidemic in the United States. We produced something called the Roadmap to Pandemic Resilience and a supplement to it. Um, and this was basically focused around the idea of testing, tracing, and supported isolation at a massive scale. Um, and it had quite a bit of impact. So uh, the CDC changed some important guidance partially based on this and our recommendations were endorsed by uh, Biden adopted in three states as policies and embraced by a large fraction of Congress. However, as all of you probably noticed, uh, that was not sufficient to, in the time necessary, achieve the national consensus we'd require to effectively address the disease. These figures are now very, very out of date, obviously, but um, the situation is probably quite a bit worse now. Um, and, uh, there, you know, it, it seems very likely that the U.S. is going to lose a significant chunk of one percent of the population to the disease, um, and uh, at the same time suffer the worst economic shock since the Great Depression. Now, the thing that I think is remarkable about COVID as an incident is that, you know, politics is usually a lot of. Um, unverifiable opinion uh, and people say this does that it's hard to tease out any causation but there's a few moments in human history where we get really clear pretty objective feedback about success and failure war is one of them um, obviously the fall of france led to a fundamental discrediting of the existing regime there um, the uh, uh, launch of Sputnik or, you know, the space race was another example of this. Uh, some of the, you know, debates between Khrushchev and Nixon, Nixon over uh, consumer life in the two countries. So there, there, there are a few times in history where we really get these shocking generation defining demonstrations of whether a social system works or doesn't. 
And I think the COVID uh, one is like that. Uh, the, in, in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see um, in, you know, the darker is the uh, more deaths per million that, that a region has suffered from COVID. And as you see, um, obviously the data is not so great in Africa and Latin America, but Western Europe and, the, and North America are just by far the hardest hit regions um, of the developed world. Um, and I think the way we ended up here uh, was really from a, a false choice. Uh, the data now shows very clearly was false. On the one hand, you had um, people calling for uh, you know, opening the economy to uh, revive uh, you know, people's livelihoods. And on the other hand, you had people who were focused on sustaining lockdowns. And I think both of these sides were just totally um, missing the key point. For, first of all, it's not even possible to end lockdowns. Lockdowns were not really a policy. Lockdowns were mostly a response to people's fear of the prevalence of the disease. And we can see this um, in uh, the data. So in, in Sweden, where they had no lockdown, they um, actually suffered almost as severe of an economic contraction as the rest of Europe because people were afraid to go out. So people locked themselves down effectively. And similarly, most of the drop in economic activity on the right here at hand that you see here happens way before the actual lockdown and is coordinated with rising media attention and focus on the disease. So this notion that you could just like, oh, let's end the lockdown, th this is not a meaningful uh, prescription. On the other hand, the notion that lockdowns are a policy that's gonna address the disease is crazy because the reality is that essential workers are about 40% of the workforce. They have to stay out there doing their um, jobs. They can't uh, stay home and they're gonna keep spreading the disease. And actually, they're going to spread the disease to the people who are most vulnerable, the people in long-term care facilities who constitute a majority of the deaths throughout the country. And uh, lower-income people, working-class people, are not going to be able to just stay at home. They can't afford it. Um, and so we saw way lower um, uh, adherence to lockdowns among those populations and much quicker exit from lockdown. So what all lockdown does is at the best, try to buy you a little bit of time partially to put in place a strategy. What strategy? Well, every country that succeeded in dealing with this followed some pretty simple principles. Uh, the, mo the most crucial one of them was testing, tracing, and supported isolation, where people um, uh, who had symptoms get tested. You trace people they were in contact with, you test those people, and you continue tracing until you eliminate the disease from the population and you support the isolation of the people who are testing positive. Second, um, basically every successful country uh, adopted mask wearing universally in public spaces. And third, pretty much every successful country significantly restructured public spaces so as to make them more hygienic, to create social distance and everything from public transit to uh, uh, public amenities, restaurants, et cetera. Um, these are very basic, clear principles, but it was extremely slow to achieve consensus on these in um, the West. And the consequences of that are, are quite dramatic. So, and, and, and really illustrate how stupid this discussion about um, the trade-off was. So uh, on the vertical axis here, I've um, plotted the expected impact of COVID-19 on the um, economic outcomes, the GDP growth uh, in 2020 of a bunch of countries. And on the horizontal axis, I've plotted um, deaths per 100,000 people from COVID. And if there were a trade-off, uh, you would expect to see a positive relationship here, but that's obviously not what you see. Um, and there are really three clusters of countries. There's the Asian and Australasian countries in, in purple, there's the um, sort of romance Europe and North America countries in blue. And then there's sort of Northeastern Europe, um, Scandinavia, 
uh, et cetera, in, in green here. And what you see very clearly is the countries that lost the fewest people also saw the least economic damage. Um, and they were the ones who used the strategies that we just described. And, and the differences here are truly staggering. So the horizontal axis on, on a logarithmic scale, Belgium lost um, almost 10,000 times as many people as Taiwan did per capita to the disease. And that's, our, that's just so far. Um, and you know, as we noted, these were concentrated in the sort of romance parts of Western Europe, United States, North America, et cetera. And I think that the logical implication of this graph is that you've got a group of countries on the bottom right that manifestly failed to protect their populations and that um, destroyed their economies in the worst shock since the Great Depression. And you have another group of countries that hardly lost anyone and had very mild economic outcomes. Um, and I think that's gonna fundamentally undermine the legitimacy of the governance regimes in Western Europe uh, and North America. And create a very powerful opening that's already uh, being stepped into for the uh, government of the People's Republic of China to argue that um, only a technocratic authoritarian uh, regime like the Chinese is capable of coordinating an effective response to a crisis like this. Um, in fact, Twitter recently took down a bunch of Chinese accounts that were precisely trying to make this argument. And this argument, I think, uh, obviously is going to initially at least get more pushback within the West, but it's already making huge headway in uh, Africa and increasingly in Latin America. But even within the US, obviously, you know, Chinese government is not going to be particularly appealing. But, you know, Silicon Valley in many ways uh, has, has a analogous uh, vision, at least in certain parts of it. Uh, it's often called fully automated luxury communism, um, in which we use all the data available you know, to us uh, as a concentrated set of uh, you know, tech planners to organize um, a society according to the best technical expertise and allow everybody else to you know, receive a universal basic income and uh, enjoy themselves uh, rather than participating as producers in, in, in their societies. But the interesting thing actually is that if we um, look within region uh, rather than across region, the, pi the picture is quite different from, from the Chinese uh, uh, story, the authoritarian bureaucratic story. In fact, um, the countries that did the best were Taiwan, um, and Hong Kong, if you consider that a separate country. China, it's a little bit uncertain because we don't have the data, but Singapore you know, did very well, South Korea did very well. Um, Taiwan and Hong Kong are obviously uh, much more democratic uh, countries, countries with a much deeper digital democracy tradition uh, than is China, uh, and certainly than are the uh, Western countries uh, they, they all have an appearance of democracy, although formalism of democracy, but as those who heard Audrey Tang's talk, the reality of democracy in those regions is much more powerful and participatory uh, even than the Western liberal democracies. And similarly, if we look within the broad West, the countries that did the best, like Estonia um, and Finland, also have powerful traditions of you know, harnessing digital tools for democratic engagement 
much in the spirit of uh, what radical exchange usually argues for. Now, what, which countries did the worst uh, within these regions? Well, they were the countries, not just the United States. You know, the United States is here uh, and it did badly, but not as badly as the UK or Belgium or Spain. All of the countries that did really poorly have very strong populist politics, but only the US and the UK and maybe Italy, depending on how you argue it, have current populist leaders. So my view is that it is not actually populist leaders that screwed up but rather the mistrust between technocrats and the public, uh, and the, you know, the populist leaders that created the problem. And I think the blame was equally on both sides. So you have this con conflict in the United States between you know, the technocrats um, instantiated by people like Anthony Fauci um, or Bet Brett Giroir and the um, political leadership. And the reality is that the technocrats uh, bear at least as much of a blame here as the politicians do. They really consistently lied to the public in ways that undermine the ability to actually mobilize the response that we needed. They um, basically advised against face mask wearing for a long time because they thought that if they advised the broader public to wear masks, that it would take masks away from uh, those who needed the most. When in fact, um, we had every capability of producing that number of masks. They just had to ask for it, but they didn't trust the political process. They didn't trust the public uh, to engage with them. Um, they insisted that we only needed a very small number of tests and that they should all be used in medical context rather than for testing, tracing and supported isolation because they didn't believe the country could scale up the production of tests or build the necessary infrastructure. So time after time, they failed to prevent, present the public with the actual choices that, that they were facing and therefore they undermined the possibility of reaching consensus. And they, in the process, won themselves a huge amount of distrust from the public, which was well-earned. Um, at the same time, you had a huge amount of distrust between technology, which in the West is organized around these large tech companies with a huge amount of power, very little connection to the public, um, and uh, the uh, you know, broader public. And this undermined the capacity to create effective uh, contact tracing. Uh, even manual contact tracing got mixed up with perceptions of digital contact tracing and created a huge amount of paranoia that undermined uh, uh, efforts to make progress on this using decentralized technologies. Um, and we have a huge partisan divide. Uh, so a disease which um, actually Republican areas had the best chances of controlling because they are lower density and less uh, concentrated, um, ended up really these Republican areas not taking many measures against the disease because it became a partisan issue, wearing masks and so forth. Now, um, the, the technocratic answer to this, that, that, you know, that we should, just should have turned this over to technocrats and everything would have been uh, you know, worked out fine, um, I think rings hollow, not just because technocrats were so untrustworthy during this, but because if you actually look at what happened in China before the public pressure came to bear, there was actually a doctor who detected the disease and warned about it very early on who was dismissed from his job and ended up dying of the disease alone um, because the system was so internally focused and unable to receive that feedback from the public. And of course, that's a tale as old as time. Um, the second largest genocide in all history uh, was the Holodomor, uh, the Ukrainian genocide, uh, which was basically driven by um, messages about starvation in Ukraine, not getting back to the inner circle of Stalin because they were so focused on maximizing industrial output. The city of Brasilia, uh, where I believe some of our speakers called in from, is another classic example of when you plan things from the top down without citizen engagement, you build unlivable spaces. Um, privatization in Eastern Europe, again, planned by you know, people from 
uh, Harvard and Washington and, and turned into a disaster. Facebook's uh, presence in Myanmar, um, you know, leaving things to the algorithms missed out on the death and destruction they were causing. And I don't know if anyone read the piece I had in Pro Market, but the US spectrum auctions, I think very close to home. So what happens when you use mar market design mechanisms on the same kinds of ideas we're talking about in radical exchange, but you don't do it as part of a social movement that communicates the ideas and builds them up from the bottom up, but instead what, what they call whispers in the ears of princes, just talks to the policymakers and those in power, um, you ended up with a situation where basically friends of the designers made billions of dollars at the expense of the public. That is what technocracy means. That is what we are going to get if we um, embrace a technocratic uh, alternative to uh, our um, present uh, uh, liberal democracies. But there is an alternative. And I think it's best instantiated by uh, the story of Taiwan, which Audrey so powerfully articulated yesterday. Um, and, and the Taiwanese story is, is remarkable, not just in the COVID moment, where they, um, if you look at this graph again, lost uh, a, a almost 10 times fewer people than even China did per capita. And they're, they're a far tinier country. Um, and uh, it's not just remarkable in COVID, they've been able to deal with all sorts of problems in a truly amazing way. And they're, they're, they have a story and a narrative that can unite us across political lines. Um, the uh, Audrey and her uh, Gov Zero uh, movement grew out of the Sunflower Movement, which was the uh, Taiwanese version of Occupy. Um, but unlike Occupy, it didn't fizzle. It didn't die off into recriminations and failed presidential campaigns and so forth. It became uh, a, a central part of Taiwanese government. Um, their demands were all accepted by the government. Every uh, minister in the Taiwanese government, even the right wing nationalist government was required to have a reverse mentor who was a member of the movement to teach them about how to practice democracy more effectively. And then when the new government came in, the, the uh, more center left DPP, they put uh, Audrey into the digital ministry. Uh, so this is an incredibly powerful story for the left about how to actually channel the energy of a protest movement to show what democracy really looks like, which is not just people out on the streets or occupying, but people forming consensus and um, bringing uh, clear platforms and not just platforms, but democratic processes into the heart of how a society governs itself. But the story of Taiwan powerfully appeals to the right as well. Um, it is a small country uh, with China uh, breathing down its neck that defends religious uh, liberty and that uh, stands up to authoritarianism. Um, so, you know, there, there's a um, instinctive, maybe even somewhat uh, uh, racialized nationalism that uh, some in the United States uh, can turn towards, but Taiwan offers a much more positive uh, vision of an alternative to China where there really is a different, uh, e different social political model that's working extremely well and defending uh, you know, the values of liberal democracy, um, modernizing those values and showing how they uh, can endure and uh, outcompete those of bureaucratic authoritarianism. And the story of Taiwan powerfully speaks to the political center because it addresses so many of the key issues that we face today. Whether uh, fake news, uh, Taiwan faced the greatest threat from uh, misinformation um, anywhere in the world because it was coming straight out of the Chinese government and yet they uh, it had almost no impact on their election. Um, populism, they saw down uh, populist leaders again inspired by uh, Chinese government but also rising up from celebrities within their society. They've been one of the more effective countries in dealing with global warming. They have an incredibly powerful digital democracy. 
they um, have dealt really effectively with problems of inequality, both regionally and across classes within their country. So it's, it's an incredibly powerful uh, story across the political spectrum uh, of US and, and Western Europe. And I think therefore we, we should really think of radical exchange as a way to take that story on a small island uh, and make it something that can appeal to people uh, throughout the uh, liberal democracies and, and really throughout the whole world. And Audrey has been one of the most powerful voices in, in doing that, making that translation. Um, and let me just give you a few examples of where I see the us as radical exchange being able to sort of formalize and spread the, the, the message of what's going on in Taiwan, especially in this COVID moment. So COVID has disrupted so many of the in-person mechanisms of democracy we have. Uh, most of the petition campaigns for ballot initiatives or uh, recalls have been um, interrupted by social distancing. But in Taiwan, they have petition platforms, digital petition platforms using things like quadratic voting. Um, and, uh, you know, in-person meetings of uh, congressional committees, legislative committees have been disrupted by COVID. In Taiwan, they were already using um, virtual reality to do deliberation uh, in order to put people onto more equal footing, uh, in order to address some of the inequities um, that arise in standard in-person interactions. Um, and I think that this moment when we have to do distance democracy gives us a huge opening to show that distance democracy can be powerful, inclusive, participatory democracy. Um, and I think we have exactly the mechanisms, whether it's a uh, QV, um, uh, wiki surveys like poll.is, uh, virtual reality deliberation. These are the tools we need to uh, show people can uh, make democracy uh, meaningful in not just the socially distant time, but the broader digital transformation that they have accelerated. Um, and that digital transformation has ended up, unfortunately, meaning unemployment and misery for uh, tens of millions of people in the West. Uh, we've seen what this you know, future of a purely digital economy looks like. And it looks like a few corporations uh, having record valuations and uh, millions of people uh, standing on um, uh, welfare and uh, unemployment lines. And I think that this will focus people's mind on the desperate need to ensure that within the digital economy, all the value is not concentrating in the hands of a few people. And in fact, Taiwan has been a leader in this. The data um, cooperatives that we've been advocating for are central to many of the services that have been created in Taiwan that even dealt with the COVID problem. And uh, data dignity, there's never been a better moment for data dignity when people see that now that they're forced to do everything online, they realize how they're being cut out of the production process and being turned into serfs and all the value is uh, congregating in um, the owners uh, of that uh, digital infrastructure. So we, we have a clear story about what they did differently in Taiwan and we have a clear story about what we can do to achieve the same uh, in our economy. And finally, there, you know, the biggest, most affluent, uh, most opportunity hoarding cities like uh, New York and um, many on the West Coast have seen total collapses in their real estate value falling 30, 40% uh, because all the amenities that they depend on are closed in these times. And I think this has made people really realize how crucial public goods are to all the value that people claim as these private individual uh, uh, things. Um, without the amenities, New York is nothing. None of the property, none, none of the 
Trump hotels, not, not, none of that has any value without the city being open. And if the city cannot provide public goods like TTSI uh, and, and public health, the, the city, all the value of the real estate will disappear. And Taiwan uh, has more than any country in the world long understood this. Um, and they implemented ideas like the like salsa, the cost, um, before anyone else in the world. Uh, they've been doing it since uh, the 1940s, based on the ideas of Sun Yat-sen. So again, there's a powerful story there about how treating the collective value collectively allows for the investments that actually support the creation of that value. I bet most of the people who suffered this 40% loss, those property owners, wish that they just had paid a little bit higher property taxes and the city could have afforded to stop uh, the total collapse of commerce that has cost them most of the value of their, of their property. So what do we have to do? We have to tell these stories and we have to tell them in many different ways. We have to tell them um, like Annika and Christopher told them uh, in Being Human yesterday. We have to tell them through comic books. We have to tell them through art fairs. We have to tell them through slideshows, through books, through presentations, through, um, through uh, public campaigns, through films. We need to make people feel the realism of an alternative and better world. There used to be a time when people would say, um, well, you, you can't, uh, uh, you know, in the United States, you might be able to do X, I don't know, provide good water, uh, uh, feed certain people, but you know, in X, Y, and Z developing country, we can't afford that. You know, nowadays we have the opposite attitude. It's like, well, of course they can do that in Kerala, India or Vietnam, but like you could never do that in the United States. We need to reverse that attitude. We need to make people see that we have the capability in our hands to create these uh, alternative visions. We need to show people artistically how it feels. We need to show people real world examples and we need to make them see that there are scalable formalized mechanisms that people uh, can implement. We need to live these out ourselves. We can't just uh, tell the stories. We have to be the stories ourselves. And we're doing that all around the world, the radical exchange groups around the world, the games that we play. The, I just learned, uh, for example, that Civilization VI, uh, a, a popular video game has a whole bunch of stuff that was based on radical exchange ideas. Um, so pe people are living this and, and, and I hope you all uh, will join us in doing it. And we need to lead. Uh, and we have an amazing set of political leaders Jonathan Herzog, who's running for Congress in New York and has been doing a number of events here. Uh, Danielle, who gave a talk yesterday, I hope uh, is going to engage in politics. Michelle Rempel, who, who led, led a panel today, um, will hopefully uh, be one of the next prime ministers of Canada. And Claudia Lopez, who, who ended up not being able to make it, but is, has a great relationship with us, is currently the mayor of Bogota, Colombia, hopefully uh, next, next president of Columbia. The, if we don't act, if we don't work together, if we don't do all the things that are required of us, we will deserve to have lost the values of pluralism. And we will deserve to have ended up with bureaucratic authoritarian uh, rule uh, as in China, because we will not have delivered the foundations of our legitimacy. Um, but we don't have to let that happen. I hope you all will join us and make today a dedication towards building a, a democracy that's worthy of the uh, 21st century um, that we can all uh, believe in. Thank you. Wow, Glenn, that was, that was truly penetrating and really, really well done. Um, I, I want to start off with, with COVID. I, I know there's a lot to unpack here, but let, let's start off. Are, are you feeling hopeful that we can make change? Or, I mean, it seems that all our responses have sort of failed. Now we're seeing spikes uh, throughout the southern region. Are, are you hopeful at all? I think it's pretty unlikely that we're going to avoid catastrophic outcomes from COVID in, in the broad West. 
Uh, I think, uh, you know, about a month ago, I left the immediate COVID response um, work and I returned to thinking about the future of, you know, liberal democracy because um, I, I came to the view that um, the window there had mostly closed and that um, what we now needed to do was deal with the fallout from that. Um, and really, you know, one thing that made me feel strongly that way was when armed protesters came into the Minnesota, uh, the Michigan State House. Um, but obviously, that turned out to be more prescient than I thought it would be. And I think that um, the recent uh, struggle for racial justice, my guess is only a beginning of the questioning of the fundamental dysfunction and inequality that um, fill our societies, both in the US and in a lot of Western Europe. So I think my attention is turned towards that and away from uh, the immediate uh, uh, saving of life. So I think we did manage to save some life. And of course, along the edges, we can make an important difference, but I don't think we can avoid a catastrophic outcome. I think it's too late for that. Yeah, and, and I, I think when you were talking about Taiwan, what, what struck me is the inability of our states to share these protocols that work. Um, how do we as radical exchange or more broadly, how do we look for states to be able to cross nationality, share what emerges from these liberal democratic states that we've seen that have been able to fight COVID or even institute digital practices that have uh, alleviated some civic burdens? Yeah, I mean, I think radical exchange itself, these conferences are a great platform for sharing those practices. And then the question is, how does one propagate them outward? And I think that um, the, the range of practices that are in this community, even more this year than last year, are just critical for that. We've heard so many diverse ways of communicating these things from Ruth Catlow's amazing work of bringing quadratic voting into art exhibits to Crystal Good's uh, amazing social media engagement uh, for the African American community in West Virginia, to um, you know Danielle's more refined academic uh, consensus building among you know uh, the mainstream media, and we need all of these things simultaneously, and we need a platform like Radical Exchange that allows them to communicate with each other, learn from each other, and uh, uh, spread the the best practices. Yeah, and I, I think what was interesting for me was um, when you were talking about the, the issues with technocracy, it seems that the, what COVID has uh, shown many people is that the Silicon Valley mythos is not, able, not gonna be able to save us and there's, there's a bit of a, a flaw there. Um, can you speak to a bit about what we can learn and what, how we can more readily distribute ideation in the States as opposed to solely looking to Silicon Valley or even maybe New York in certain respects? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I actually think that many of the companies and in fact, the polling shows this acted incredibly irresponsibly in the COVID situation. The, you know, in, in World War II, um, Ford immediately started making bombers when Pearl Harbor was bombed. What, what exactly did American business do to address our situation? How much easier would it have been to make a certain number of tests to get a few hundred thousand contact tracers trained than it was to build the US Army to go fight the Nazis? And we weren't able to do it. And no one took responsibility. Everyone wanted to cover their butts and let their stock price rise. And none of them were facing the devastation that ordinary Americans were facing. And so they weren't focused on it. They didn't think it was that big of a deal. They were just teleworking at home, you know? They just wanted to avoid stepping in some doo-doo by like, you know, getting involved in some contact tracing thing that looked bad. None of them were willing to actually take responsibility for the social infrastructure on which all of their profits depend. Um, and so I don't think we can look to a class like that to save us. We need a way to make sure that the expertise that exists in those places 
is forced to grapple with the consequences for people on the ground of their failure to respond to the needs of the public. And that's what's so amazing about Taiwan. Rather than so many of their services being built by these platforms for what they think people need, they bubble up out of society and then government responds to those with some support from the tech companies that is brought on by pressure from civil society and the government. That's the type of structure that we need for our digital, digital services. Emergent public utilities of, of various forms rather than you know, top-down plan efforts by tech companies. Yeah, no, amazing. And I, I think we've, we've bandied these ideas of radical exchange um, even prior to COVID. And we, yeah. we've, we've sought to find ways to deepen equality, make things, make things better. But I think COVID has uh, sort of removed the, the cloth over what some, some things that we're hiding. We're seeing racial unrest uh, in, in cities. We're seeing rural unrest. As you mentioned, the protesters going into uh, the, the courthouses uh, demanding their ability to wear masks and things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you think that there is a way for us to immediately, as a radical exchange, uh, well, not, perhaps not immediately, but how do we enter this fray and how do we best uh, position ourselves as, as a foundation or as our, our global chapters? How do we best position ourselves? I think, you know, again, I'll turn to Danielle Allen, who wrote a wonderful uh, uh, piece in the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago, who said, who said, we seek reforms to policing, but we need something deeper. The reality is that the protest movements, which remain just protest and do not become a civic conversation, don't lead to transformation. The protests like those in Taiwan, which build from the momentum of a protest to a meaningful platform for consensual deliberation, change the societies they live in. And they change them not just for the goals of that protest, they change them permanently by showing people a better way of organizing that conversation. And that conversation needs to hear both of those perspectives. It needs to hear the demand for racial justice. And it needs to hear the demand for geographic justice. This is a hard message, I think, for a lot of people on the left to hear, but the reality is that as problematic as the Trump administration's response to COVID was, the notion that the wealthiest cities in the country need to be bailed out by the federal government was ridiculous. Those wealthy cities should have been taxing the rents, the land rents that they've never been taxing because they're controlled by the oligarchs. Everyone thinks, oh, these are such liberal places. Cuomo is so great. The, the, the property taxes in New York are ridiculously low. The property taxes in California are ridiculously low. These huge rents are going to a very small number of people. The rural areas are far poorer and they've been left out of their fair share of those rents. So there's actually a lot of justice in rural people saying, you've got a bunch of wealthy cities who've been excluding us from all the opportunities who've been channeling all the rents to a small oligarchy that lives in those cities. And now they're asking us to pay for the you know, control of a disease, which they failed to do anything about. Uh, that makes no sense, right? So there, there are good things on, I believe on all sides of these discussions. And we need to have platforms that aren't just about screaming our own demands, but hearing the demands of others and finding consensus, finding compromise, using mechanisms like quadratic voting, polis, et cetera. Right, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna open up to uh, the questions from the audience. Um, one of them, it says, Glenn, has COVID made you increase your opinion on the importance of national governments? Um, I, I, so I don't think that national governments are the key thing. I think the key question is what is the trading area or what is the travel area and how does that align to um, the 
you know, public health administration. So the United States is a great example where you can travel across states, but you cannot, there's no coordination of public health in any effective way across states. That doesn't work. But on, but on the other hand, if states could restrict travel between them, then that would work fine. You wouldn't need it to necessarily be done by a national government. So the, the, the key issue is the alignment between different elements of policy, different elements of coordination. And in fact, I think federal systems work great. I mean, Germany was very effective, but that was because it managed to get that alignment right. And the US has, because of uh, undue reverence for a constitution that itself was meant as sort of an experiment, uh, has stayed rigidly to a particular set of divisions that don't actually correspond to the contemporary patterns of travel and um, commerce. Yeah, and one of the questions which, which I think dovetails with an idea that I, I was thinking about when you had the, the we need to lead a slide um, and thinking about uh, Jonathan Herzog and thinking about James Felton Keith, thinking about a lot of politicians that are involved in the radical exchange movement. Uh, this person asked, what happened when you try to make recommendations to US government on COVID response? But also I, I wanna tie that to, is just electing people that um, have radical exchange ideas or are interested in implementing radical exchange ideas, does that, that I, I know it's part of a multi-frontal pro problem, but how, 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 how do you see that um, accelerating the change we need? So I don't think that the path to the change we need is primarily some form of top-down policy. I actually think the main role of electing people and having sort of concrete visible successes like that is that it inspires people to believe that change is possible, not the direct impact it has itself. Um, and conversely, I think that a lot of people in the movement are gonna be working for those concrete changes. But in the end, the actual victory is those people themselves living that change. Uh, ultimately, I think the great victory of radical exchange will come not when it is eventually formalized by winning presidencies or whatever, but when people are living it enough so that that formalization seems just like a formal blessing of something that already exists. Um, and that is the back and forth between sort of living practice and, um, and goals that, that, that we all need to seek. And that's the reason why the balance between arts and culture on the one hand and you know, political action is so critical. Yeah, and we, we have uh, one more minute or so. Um, Glenn, our first dinner, you, you spoke so highly of the, the role Hannah Arendt and Henry, Henry George had on you. Uh, what, would, what, what do you think they would make of this political moment or, or, or this cultural moment? What, what do you think they would say about where we are and maybe think through what their ideas uh, have given you in terms of the way forward? Um, that's a great question. Uh, you know, the, what I just said about sort of the relationship between formal power and the way we actually live our lives very much comes from our end. Um, that a successful revolution has to be a revolution that we live and then only becomes uh, broader once we're already living it. Um, and George, I think, would focus on the critical need to communicate with broad publics. Um, and to not allow knowledge to become the reserve of the expert insulated from the rest of society, but instead to be a conversation between the public and those who serve it, uh, uh, experts and, and uh, innovators. Glenn, this was uh, amazing. Thank you for the time and thank you for the talk. Talk to you soon. Yeah. Thanks, Manny. Bye.